Thank you very much, Alan. I appreciate that. That was a phenomenal introduction. I couldn't have said it better myself. And, uh, and thank you all for, for joining us today. And we look forward to, uh, to merging out. Alex, can you just make sure your megaphone is on and the on air, just to double check? Absolutely. On air, going on air. And megaphone on, just megaphone check. Yep, it should be blue. All Excellent. All right, go to your head. All right, so AI will be talking about cognitive performance training in virtual reality. Next slide, please. So the presentation topics that we'll be covering in today's presentation are listed here on the slides. And so we'll be starting with what is virtual reality as a technology? creating a sense of presence, your brain on virtual reality, defining cognitive performance and what that means. So often hard skills, improving cognitive performance, and finally a case study, cue recognition, which is our augmented reality medical education app for teaching diagnostic cue recognition, which is currently in soft launch and available for pre-release. Next slide, please. Alex, you're cutting out a bit here. Hold on one second. Just, uh, you're, you're cutting out a little bit. Can we uh, hear a little bit more? Maybe count to 10? One, one, two, two three. three. You're back now. Okay. 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 Awesome. So what is virtual reality as a technology? Virtual reality as a technology is an immersive medium that allows an individual to teleport to a digital world where they're immersed in a non-physical environment that feels real to them because of the sensory perception that they're being or the sensory perception that they're being provided with. This technology is not new. It's been around since 1968. The initial virtual reality headset was called the Sword of Democles. It was created by a gentleman by the name of Ivan Sutherland in 1968. Ivan and his research student were looking for ways to enable helicopter pilots to effectively and safely land helicopter operations at night. And so the initial VR headset that you see on the far right hand side of the screen there hung from the roof. It was supported by a metal pole because it was so awkward and heavy. And it was run by a computer the size of an office cubicle. Fast forward to 2013 and a young man by the name of Lucky Palmer turned around and through some ingenious engineering got two cell phone screens along with some great cell phone or some, excuse me, some great software engineering to work as a prototype. He then went out and raised money on Kickstarter to build the initial Oculus developer kit VR headsets. And that was in 2013. Fast forward to 2019, and we now see the industry standard is moving towards wireless six, degree, six degrees of movement and freedom in a headset that is capable of supporting itself just by pushing a power button. Next slide, please. So when we talk about presence and what is the, the power of virtual reality to create this engaging learning experience that people take away and they remember, something that is tangible and it, it changes the educational experience and that happens because of presence. Presence by definition, is immersion into virtual reality, as a which is a perception of being physically present in a non-physical world. The sense, of the sense of perception, or presence, is created by surrounding the user of the VR system with images, sounds, and other stimuli, such as haptic feedback, that elicit a physiological response and a neurological response that the body treats as real. Our brains are a beautiful combination of essentially a cognitive illusion factory where our perceptions, our life experiences, our cognitive bias, these all come together to create what we perceive as reality. And so through four components, the first one being high quality graphics because virtual reality is powered on the visual element that provides human beings with the majority of their, their sensory input through their eyes. The second part of that is spatial audio. And Yanni in his presentation was talking about the, the importance of spatial audio because it creates that intuitive nature. When I hear a sound to the left-hand side, 
I need to turn and I need to look to the left hand side. That's intuitive nature. This is something that as a primal instinct, human beings are conditioned to do. So by providing spatial audio within a virtual realm, you're now creating these intuitive reactions that enable a user to move and interact within a virtual non-physical environment in the exact same way that they would be experiencing the physical realm. So when I reach out and I touch the desk in front of me, that's the physical realm, but this virtual room that we're in, this is an illusion. It's an optical illusion that we've all bought into. The third part of that is hand presence. Hand presence is critical because this is as uh, on the presumption, the assumption that you have both of your hands as a healthy adult, that is how you primarily interact with the world. We don't walk around and use our feet to open doors or text on our cell phones. These are tasks that are handled by our hands. So seeing physical hands that represent move and interact in virtual reality creates that sense of presence that allows the brain to go, hey, I'm actually performing this task. I'm seeing my hands, my fingers are moving. Uh, there's one gentleman here, it looks like his hand is coming out of his ear. That's a bit of an awkward position. And you can see that that's all, all of a sudden no longer intuitive. Yeah, sorry, I don't mean to put you on the spot there, but I just hit your hand all of a sudden was coming out of your ear and I thought, oh, that's too funny. I can't miss that opportunity. And finally, I'll back up just a little bit here so I'm not in the way, but the fourth part of, of presence, and this is new, but I, I'm actually, I'm, I'm going to state and argue my case here. When virtual reality was first introduced, this technology, as I've mentioned, is not new, but up until the last two years has been traditionally burdened by and tethered by a cord. There's this cord that pulls on the back of your head and no matter what you do, no matter how you move, you're aware of that cord, which limits the sense of presence, limits the sense of embodiment that you as a user can experience. And we'll talk about now what is your brain, what's happening in your brain on virtual reality. Next slide, please. So when we talk about cognitively what's happening in virtual reality, your brain, as I mentioned, is this beautiful optical illusion factory. Two components of the human brain, the neurocortex and the cerebral cortex, or excuse me, the neurocortex and the visual cortex make up the main components that receive and interpret the optical input and sensory input that we're gathering from our environment. So regardless of whether this is the real physical world where you can reach out and touch the desk, or whether this is the virtual world where we've got myself as a robot with a spinning propeller head, these are all sensory inputs that everyone is able to see and make sense of. How we all perceive them is differently, but the way that our brain is interpreting what we're seeing and what we're currently experiencing, it is treating this like a real experience. Because we have that high, because we have those high quality visuals, because we have that intuitive nature where when I hear someone talking over to the left, I turn and I look, I can see my hands, they move and they interact away in a way that's appropriate to what my brain says, hey, that's the way that your hands move and interact when you pull through the text. But for example, there's nothing I can move around in this room that I'm presenting to you all from without any obstructions. There's no cord pulling on the back of my head anymore. So I feel like I'm here. And that directly impacts the learning and retention of virtual reality. You see that on the left-hand side of the scale on the bottom here, traditional methods of education, such as the reading and lecturing in two-dimensional video, those are yielding retention rates for students learning skills in, in between 5 and 15%, and that's arguable depending on who you talk to. I don't want to dive too deeply into that because they all fall into what's known as the traditional educational model, where a teacher or an instructor or facilitator passes knowledge to students from the front of the classroom. Students ingest this knowledge and then they're expected to be able to repeat and regurgitate it. Virtual reality changes the learning experience. Now you're able to actually engage. You're able to go through the experience. You're able to go through the learning experience. Then you're able to receive measurable and actionable feedback because data analytics are improving. We're able to see during certain points in the learning experience, this is a point of interest to you. Why don't we go back and do this again? And when you start to combine that with human biometrics to measure physiological performance, you're now able to really hone in, no pun intended, 
on certain areas of performance that you as a learner want to improve. And this is changing the way that you see the educational model delivered. And there, there's another component to that, and that is soft skills versus hard skills. And if we could have the next slide, please, I apologize. I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. I'm, I'm one slide ahead of myself. So really quickly, defining cognitive performance. What is cognitive performance for the purpose of, of learning soft skills and improving cognitive performance in virtual reality? By definition for today, cognitive performance is your ability to pay attention, to create judgment, and to evaluate a situation. From there, it's the formation of knowledge and memory, followed up by your ability to pass judgment, create reason or reason with complex or cognitive problems and the ability to solve issues regardless of what the complexity of that issue is that is cognitive performance at its foundational level next slide please so when we talk about soft and hard skills currently the educational model of of current is traditionally based we are teaching hard skills that are measurable, they're quantifiable, they are succinct, and they are structured in the way that we deliver the educational model. An example of a hard skill would be learning basic arithmetic or even advanced arithmetic. There is a, um, a correct solution that must come out of a, a mathematical equation. And I'm, I'm gonna use two plus two as a very basic example because there's, there's very little argument or room for argument about two plus two equals four. However, how do we teach soft skills? What type of educational model are we using to deliver interpersonal communication um, or other types of traditional or non-traditional educational um, methods such as emotional intelligence, social intelligence? How do you gauge the, the, the reaction and the value of a conversation between two human beings when we're not currently teaching those skills and because of the engagement of technology especially among Generation Z and future generations that human element is going to continue to be missing so now using virtual reality you can substitute those learning experiences using artificial intelligence and digital avatars and they don't necessarily need to be high quality cinematic level avatars you can have an experience with a, a learning experience where you're talking to a low fidelity avatar but you're having a difficult conversation you're providing feedback to someone or you're receiving feedback and you're learning an appropriate way to say hey thank you very much that's good feedback i need to use that moving forward in my own educational experience next slide please So when we talk about improving cognitive performance, and I do apologize, I am just rushing here just a little bit to catch up so that the presentation stays on track. So there's three points when we're talking about improving cognitive performance, and all three of these can be applied seamlessly using the virtual realm. The first point is mastery learning. So take a very specific skill, whether it be a soft skill or a hard skill, break it down, learn it in, very, in a very structured and measurable format. The second part of that is deliberate practice. So when you're learning a skill, you need to identify strict components of said skill. You need to break it down into very manageable packages, and then you need to receive immediate feedback from an expert. It doesn't matter if you train and train and train and you do this a skill or a procedure a hundred or a thousand times if you're doing it wrong. You need that feedback from an expert and you should be receiving that feedback immediately. Using virtual reality as a learning medium, we're now able to replicate these type of situations where a user can go through a learning experience, they can practice a difficult skill, whether it be a software or a hard skill, and they can receive immediate digital feedback from a digital expert. Along with that, all of the data and analytics that are being collected during the learning experience are now measurable and they can be used as benchmarks. By changing the way that we teach these skills, by changing the way that we, we deliver this educational experience, you're able to increase the learning retention, but you're also, incre you're also developing that self-awareness, that situational awareness that individuals end up in these situations and they go, hey, I need to use these skills to be able to effectively mitigate the situation, whatever it may be. 
Next slide, please. So when we talk about a case study, uh, at Home Virtual Education, as Alan so eloquently put, our mission is to save lives. And the way that we're doing that is we're educating medical professionals on diagnostic cue recognition. Diagnostic cue recognition was attributed as the third leading cause of death in the United States of America in 2016. And this is published from a study done by John Hopkins University. The reason for errors in medical diagnosis is a combination of situational awareness, cognitive overload, and the inability to effectively train on medically accurate real-life patients. What you're seeing here is screenshots of our application using augmented reality-enabled iOS smartphone or iPad devices, and you're able to actually have medically accurate patients that appear using augmented reality, and you can go through and practice diagnosis as many times as you want during the learning experience and then if you, as you can see here on the right hand side or excuse me on the left hand uh, right hand side of the screen for for everyone looking at the screen this is that immediate feedback that i'm talking about so now as a user on an application that's available on your smartphone you're immediately engaging in mastery learning deliberate practice and you're receiving actionable feedback that teaches you how to improve. And so not only do we have you go through and practice categorization of the patients, you then have to, or excuse me, severe, severity categorization, you actually have to go through and justify the learning experience and why you made the severity categorization based on patient presentations. And using augmented reality, we're able to simulate the medical nuances that previously have never been deliverable in the learning and educational experience. So this is available currently on the Apple Store. It's available as a pre-release. If I could have the next slide, please. And that, that's the end of my presentation. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, I apologize, it was a little bit rushed today, there were a couple more points that I would have liked to have gone into, into more detail, but Yanni was doing such a wonderful job explaining the Glue platform and, and had some great questions, so uh, please take some time, visit, visit us on the website. As I mentioned, the Home Cue Recognition application for enhanced medical education is available on, for pre-release on the Apple App Store. Please take some time if you have an Apple device, take a look at it. This is what we really feel is the future of, of augmented reality in medical education. So it is available for, uh, for pre-download and uh, please do visit our website. We've got a, our blog there and we've got all kinds of content that continues to build on exactly what I was talking about today. Any questions from the audience before we wrap up? All right, we've got some uh, applause, awesome. Thank you guys, congratulations and thank you very much, Alex. Really appreciate you taking the time to explain Awesome. So are there any questions uh, by show of uh, yeah, the applause? Do we have any questions? Questions, anybody? I have a question for you, Alex. Absolutely. So you know, you've, you've built this platform. You've, you've started working on, um, you know, on studying people's uh, not only not only on where they're looking and that sort of thing that seems to be kind of the, the standard now where you know you can look at people are looking make sure they're they're looking at the right things but you've really started measuring their physiological responses and are you finding that there's certain um, physiological responses that lend themselves better uh, to uh, you know to learning so for example one of the things that you mentioned to me you know a long time ago was you know training people in a high stress environment so that when they are actually faced with the highest high stress problem they've already kind of learned to to mitigate the environmental uh, issues to get right to the solution and is that you know are you noticing uh, that there's certain physiological um, moments where education is actually enhanced so for example people that are in just you know and you, you mentioned this as like a bell curve of stress so, you know, on the low end of stress, you're not really focused, you know, on the high end of stress, you're not, you, you're you know, overly overwhelmed. And then that kind of perfect amount of stress is where the sweet spot of education is. Can you maybe talk to that a bit? Absolutely. So what you're referring to, Alan, is called the York's Dodson Law. And the York's Dodson Law is an upside down bell curve that shows 
on the far left-hand side of the spectrum, you're bored, you're unengaged, you're not paying attention, you don't really care what I have to say. When the expectation to perform increases along the y-axis and the level of stress increases along the x-axis, you as an individual will quickly go from being unengaged to in the optimal zone of cognitive performance, that sweet spot, to very quickly tipping out of that and becoming overwhelmed. And the way that you effectively train to be able to perform in that optimal zone of cognitive performance is you develop, uh, or you go through a stress inoculation training, and you use tenements of psychology, performance psychology, such as deliberate practice and mastery learning. You're breaking a large skill down into very specific subsets. So using public speaking, for example, you have a public speaking engagement that you need to prepare for. You know you're gonna be speaking to an audience of 300 people. You know that one of the, the key important factors when you're giving that public speaking engagement is that you need to be looking all throughout the audience. You need to be using your hands. You need to be flowing freely. You don't wanna be using a lot of ums and ahs and ah. You don't want those unnatural pauses in conversation. You want to continue to flow. So take that now, and there's six or seven sub-skills within giving that presentation that are going to be critical. Using virtual reality as a medium, there are tools available, one of them being called Ovation VR, that allow you to go through and practice the public speaking experience numerous times. And so when we look at physiological response, Everyone has had that sensation of their palms getting sweaty or they feel their heart rate starting to beat. Those are cues, individual physiological cues that you're starting to experience stress. What happens is that at that point, you're now starting to slip more to the right-hand side and you're leaving that optimal zone of cognitive performance. You're, you're beginning to experience stress and it's negatively and adversely affecting your cognitive performance. By developing cognitive appraisal skills, cognitive assessment, you're now able to go through and you're able to develop that self-awareness, that situational awareness that external information and sensory information is coming in, but you also feel your hands starting to get sweaty. That's your indication to take a breath. That's your physiological reset. And so when we look at what are sensors that are available, I mean, we could talk about eye tracking, there's brainwave tracking, heart rate, uh, muscular tension, electro, electroconductivity of the skin. Uh, you can get into all kinds of weird measurements. You could get into saliva-based cortisol testing to see stress levels hormonally. There's all kinds of different sensor sets that are available. I think what people need to ask before they start getting into biometric and physiological performance is what is my desired outcome? If I'm learning to, or if my objective is to learn to perform under pressure, well, I'm not going to want to learn to meditate or I'm not going to want to meditate 30 minutes a day because guess what? When I get really stressed out, uh, closing my eyes, sitting down and crossing my legs is probably not going to be an option to me at that point. However, I can, I can learn to mitigate that physiological response, the palm sweating, the heart beating by taking a deep breath, by engaging in a technique called box breathing, where I'm using a rhythmic cycle of breathing to regulate stress during these high pressure, high stress situations. And, you know, Alan, just to build on the question really quickly, um, high pressure and high stress, our immediate focus is first responders and healthcare professionals, but everyone experiences it. They, this is not something that's isolated to people who operate in life or death situations. Chronic stress uh, had a cost of $666 billion on the U.S. economy in 2016. Chronic stress in the workplace is the third leading cause of mental, or is, excuse me, is the, is the attributed mental, is the leading attributed cause of mental illness in Canada. 37% of individuals who are, have been diagnosed with depression or anxiety attribute that directly to chronic stress generated in the workplace. So this is an epidemic that everyone is suffering from. So absolutely, there's, there's, there's definitely applicability for this in, in all as aspects of, of stress management. Thank you very much, Alex.